Good afternoon to our listeners. The response to the COVID-19 pandemic has been a multi-sector approach with the Ministry of Health leading on the management of COVID-19 on Montserrat. So today I will be speaking with officials in the Ministry of Health to obtain updates on where Montserrat stands from a health perspective. The participants in today's discussion are all from the Ministry of Health and they are Minister of Health Honorable Charles T. Kernan, Permanent Secretary Mrs. Camille Thomas Gerald, Chief Medical Officer Dr. Shara Greenaway Dubry, Director of Primary Health Care Dr. Dorothea Hazel Blake, and Director of Secondary Health Care Arlene Pontine. So I'll say good afternoon to all of you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure speaking with you this afternoon. Before we get to, into the discussion, I'll have the Minister of Health, Honorable Charles T. Kernan, provide an overview first of the health response during the COVID-19 crisis, as well as uh, share information on our current status to date. Minister, over to you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, good afternoon. As we come to give this update, I want to first give God the glory that is due his name because he's still in control of all things, including COVID. And so while we reflect on what we have done and where we hope to go, we must bear in mind that there is somebody bigger than you and I. To date, 61 local samples have been investigated for the COVID-19 disease, 11 of which have returned positive. Unfortunately, last week, Montserrat had its first fatality, and our thoughts are with the family members. Local active cases currently stands at seven, all of whom are recovering well in home isolation. Comrades, I think it is important for me to outline how we have progressed through the COVID-19 situation. What did the ministry do at the onset of the virus? The ministry provided several briefings to cabinet when coronavirus was emerging in China and also bolstered its port health monitoring when the importation of the disease was deemed at a moderate risk to the Caribbean region. The ministry also did an assessment of the local PPE stocks and acquired more to ensure that our frontline staff remained safe. When Munster had its first confirmed case, the ministry quickly established a flu clinic and developed a home visiting team to ensure that persons who had symptoms could be quickly identified, treated, and monitored. To date, the clinic has seen 134 persons with a downward trend in attendance seen in the last three weeks. This is a positive sign. Establishment of isolation facilities. The government of Montserrat has demonstrated its commitment in ensuring that it has the capacity to manage any future eventuality and outbreaks from COVID-19 that may occur by establishing isolation facilities. So initially, the physiotherapy unit of the Glendon Hospital was converted into an isolation ward. This unit can accommodate up to six persons. The government has continued to make plans to expand this capacity to treat patients of COVID-19. To this end, retrofitting works has commenced on the lower floor of Magus Memorial to convert it into an isolation ward. Renovation works will commence shortly at the Golden Years home. The residents on the top floor of Magus Memorial will be transferred to the Golden Years home after the completion. Assistance received to date, UK assistance. Montserrat has, be, has also received assistance from the UK government in the form of PPE stocks, and we are currently negotiating acquisition of further PPE stocks and equipment. We have received the following pieces of PPE from UK government so far. 7,000 gloves, 200 gowns, 400 face shields, 
100 surgical masks, 480 test kits recently received. PAHO assistance. The ministry received a shipment of PPE from PAHO on April 22nd. The shipment included 225 isolation gown sets. Each set contains one impervious gown yellow, one N95 mask, one PS safety goggles, one germicidal wipe, four alcohol prep pads, two biohazard bags, nitrile exam gloves, shoes covers, one apron, and one hairnet cap. Government of Dominica. The ministry also received a donation of 1,000 rapid antibody test kits and two BiPAP machines from the Commonwealth of Dominica on April 22nd. The BiPAP machine is a non-invasive ventilation machine. Staffing. Additional preparedness included requesting medical staffing support from Cuba. These medical personnel have already been identified and the Ministry of Health continues to work with the Office of the Premier and the Cuban government in finalizing the agreement. The Ministry is also working with the UK government to provide additional medical staff. Staff is required to cover existing vacancies within the nursing department and to provide respite for current staff. Testing capability. We are proactively preparing additional space in the lab at Glendon Hospital to accommodate local testing. We are receiving support from the UK government in procuring the machines for testing as well as the necessary testing kits and other consumables required. Our staff will receive training and additional support to build our local capacity to test from PHE England. We envisage that testing will commence within a month after the equipment is received. Passes issued on the Ministry of Health as per the suppression orders. For those persons who are in position of passes authorized by the Honorable Minister, please be informed that no new passes will be issued as these passes will be automatically extended. And I have already written to the Commission of Police on that wise. Conclusion. Residents, you would have noticed that Munster has not recorded a positive case in the last two weeks. And we are hoping that this trend will continue this week and into the next and into the months ahead. But I would like to remind you that all the gains realized over the last two weeks will be lost if persons do not adhere to the public health suppression and control orders implemented by the government of Montserrat. Please remain committed to practicing good hygiene and physical distancing, being mindful that any deviation from these practices could see a loss in progress made in containing the disease. Let us all work together to contain COVID-19. May God bless you all and may God bless Montserrat. Thank you very much, Minister. Very comprehensive overview. Uh, let's start now the discussion focusing on uh, the, the COVID-19 cases to date. We know there are seven active cases and two recoveries. All of us are eager to hear that the seven patients have fully recovered. We are all eager to hear that. So. I think it's important to start by explaining the process before a patient can be declared as having recovered. Okay, Diana, it's um, Dr. Greenaway, Jeffrey speaking. So in order for someone to be declared as not having COVID-19, there is a test that is done 14 days after the first confirmed. And you basically need two negative tests at least 24 hours apart. So on day 14, you have a test. And if that is negative, you do another test. In Montserrat, though, we are allowing for seven days to pass between both tests just to ensure that persons have cleared the virus. 
um, there is a possibility that on day 14, your test may come back positive. And so that seven day interval is important. Thanks for that explanation because I know a lot of persons, you know, are always asking about recoveries and how soon can we see, you know, the recovery numbers going up. So it's important for persons to understand that process that must be done. In terms of the management and the, the, the treatment of uh, persons with COVID-19, can you explain the process involved or the protocol for someone with COVID-19 who does not require hospitalization versus someone who is hospitalized? Okay, so basically we've been following algorithms developed by CAFA, that's the Caribbean Public Health Agency. And it basically allows you to uh, basically send the patient through the clinical pathway. For persons who do not require hospitalization, uh, the doctor would treat you as if you're having a flu because it is a flu-like illness. So you'll be having probably a fever or a cough, and so it's symptomatic treatment. You have a fever, a doctor might give you paracetamol to help you bring down your fever. You have a cough, a doctor might give you some cough syrup to help um, alleviate the cough. In terms of persons who may be hospitalized, so usually you'll be hospitalized because you would have developed pneumonia because this virus affects the lungs. So you may have difficulty breathing, for example. So when you go into hospital, they might be assisting you with your um, oxygen level. So they might be giving you supplemental oxygen. Some persons require a little bit more assistance. And so we would use machines like the CPAP or BiPAP machines and um, also other ventilation machines like the full ventilator. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, no, in terms of the Cuban doctors, Minister would have mentioned in his statement that uh, arrangements are being finalized between the Ministry of Health and uh, the Cuban government, Office of the Premier as well, to finalize when exactly the Cuban doctors can come here. Do we have any indication at this point? Uh, I know that has not yet been finalized, but do we have a rough idea as to when we can see the Cuban doctors on island? Camille Thomas-Gerald. It is important for me to indicate here that it's not just um, Cuban doctors, but a combination of doctors and nurses. Um, we anticipate that perhaps within the next maybe three week period, we will be able to have these medical personnel on island. Okay. That's our rough estimate, but we're continuing to work with the Office of the Premier in terms of finalizing the agreement. Right. And the numbers, is it 32? I, I recall hearing that number a few weeks ago. 32 was the original request from the Ministry of Health to the Republic of Cuba. Um, we are unable now at this point to say that we are going to get um, 32. It seems more in the order of 20, okay. or it could be a little less. Okay. But as we work through the logistics, then you'll be able to come back and provide an, a more updated figure. Right. And can we at this point say how long the doctors and the nurses will stay on island for? The initial request is for three months, but we envisage that it could be it could cover a three months to six months period. Right. Now, we know that um, over the past two weeks, and we're very happy to hear this, that there have been no new confirmed cases over the past two weeks. Given this trend, and if this trend continues in that we have no new infections and we also have patients recovering, do you still think that will require the services of the do Cuban doctors and nurses? Yes, we will still require this support um, from the Cuban medical personnel because we currently have nursing vacancies. Okay. So we would need the support to cover the nursing vacancies and also the staff would have been working around the clock nonstop for the last few months and therefore they would need some respite. So we therefore will need the support from the Cuban medical personnel. Thank you. And just so that we're clear, the, the medical personnel coming from Cuba, are they only coming to provide support in terms of COVID-19 patients or will they be providing overall support to the Ministry of Health? They will be providing overall support to the Ministry of Health. Okay, thank you. Now, from an epidemiological standpoint, how long can we expect to be dealing with COVID-19? Um, we know that other other uh, countries are looking at uh, saying things like, you know, one year, they, they forecast this to be a situation that could go on for a long time. Can we at this point give an indication as to how long we think? Because we know it might be difficult to say with certainty. 
Okay, the, the, the short answer is no, we cannot determine exactly how long we'll be dealing with COVID-19 because, first of all, it's a very new virus. The whole world is still learning how COVID-19 works, how it affects individuals, and it's very difficult to predict what will happen. What some countries have been doing is looking at other coronaviruses and seeing how they have panned out over the years, or we have looked at other pandemics. And if, for example, if you look back to our last pandemic, which would have been H1N1 in 2009, and even today as we speak, there are still cases of H1N1 mm -hmm. throughout the region, and, and as well as internationally. But you would recognize that people are not as alarmed because there's now a vaccine, there's now a there's proper treatment for, for H1N1. Mm -hmm. So in terms of how much more time we think we will be dealing with COVID-19, I think we may as well settle in for the long haul. It is going to take a while. It is certainly going to be months before we have no longer any concerns about COVID-19, and it would also be linked to the fact that we would expect to have a worldwide available vaccine, the advances that we're seeing in the, some of the new treatment models, modalities that are being explored and all of that. But in the meantime, we just have to continue to do the things that we've been doing, which have been helping us to contain this particular virus. Right. Now, let us touch a bit on the isolation facilities that were mentioned. Uh, it was mentioned in the minister's uh, remarks that we do have additional isolation facilities being developed and being retrofitted. Are we able to, at this point, give an estimated time frame for the finalization of the retrofitting process? Biona, we anticipate that the works will be completed within two weeks. Within two weeks from today? From today, yes. Okay, all right. And so overall, how many patients can these isolation facilities collectively um, accommodate? I note that we mentioned, it was mentioned that six persons can be accommodated on the Glendon Hospital isolation ward. Do we have any figures um, as of today as to how many persons would be able to to be accommodated at the retrofitted facilities? Okay, so so as you said, six would be at the physiotherapy and we anticipate 40 at the Magasin Memorial Home. Right, and so that the persons listening are clear, when we say isolation facilities, this is the facilities for the treatment of patients or where persons go to recover? I think that needs to be explained so that the public is clear on what the isolation facility is and what is provided there. So the isolation facilities would cater for treatment. If you're doing well and you can stay at home, you would remain at home. Mm -hmm. Right. So only persons who would require hospitalization would be required would, would be placed in the isolation facility. Right. Is there a particular standard that these facilities must be equipped or built to to allow it to be classified as an isolation facility and if so can you say what those standards are and who will set those standards um viona what we've done um we've looked at international standards and one of the things we need to do is maintain a clean area and a dirty area so we need to make sure that there is a location for staff to don meaning putting on their ppe and uh, enter into the areas where they're taking care of the patients. And there also needs to be dedicated space where they doff, which means they take off their PPE without contamination and a place for them to be able to shower, et cetera, before leaving the building. So those are some of the considerations we bore in mind in terms of setting up the isolation facilities. All right, thank you. Now, in terms of uh, testing, you know that a lot of persons have been calling for widespread testing. Do you see the Ministry of Health being in a position to accommodate this anytime soon? And if so, how will this be rolled out? Widespread testing is subject to interpretation. Mm -hmm. But what the Ministry of Health has done is that we have developed a protocol 
for the eventuality when we're now able to test on island. So presently, the protocol we have is because we're sending samples to the reference lab in Trinidad. Mm -hmm. Once we have that ability on island to test for COVID-19, then we will expand the groups that have first priority for testing. So by then, we will be expected to... Right now, we test all hospitalized patients. Anybody who's admitted to hospital, that means with um, flu-like symptoms and are considered to be at risk of COVID-19, those are individuals are tested. In the new scenario, that will also continue. Additionally, anybody who's deemed to be a close contact of a known COVID-19 patient will also be tested. And perhaps I should pause here to explain close contact because mm -hmm. what is happening is that people are deciding for themselves who is a contact and who is not a contact. There is a very clear definition that to, in order to be considered a close contact, you must have had face-to-face -face contact with a probable or confirmed case of COVID-19, being that you've been within at least one meter from that person for more than 15 minutes. So if I walk into this room, drop a message off, and you were even a COVID-19 positive, but all I did was come in for like 20 seconds or even a minute, drop the message off and leave, you are not considered a close contact. It's more likely if we lived in the same house or we, lived, we sat across each other in the same office for a duration for an entire day, then clearly it would have been more than 15 minutes, you are considered a close contact. So anybody who's identified as a close contact of a known COVID-19 patient will also be tested. Additionally, anybody who turns up at any of our health facilities, particularly the flu clinic with flu-like symptoms, will be tested. Then another group, another priority group, would be our frontline workers, our first responders, so the police officers, fire and rescue officers, prison officers, members of the Royal Montserrat Defense Force, and even some of our Red Cross volunteers who've been working with them, if these individuals turn up with any flu-like symptoms, they will be part of the priority testing. Mm -hmm. Additionally, we anticipate just random testing among those groups as well. And again, another group that would be given priority would be persons who work with vulnerable populations. So carers who provide care for older persons, persons who work in homes like Margotson Memorial and Golden Years, Golden Years because one supported, mm -hmm. they will also be considered priority for testing. All persons who are quarantined, for example, and then they'll be quarantined again because you're a contact or for other reasons, those will also be tested. So it's a, it will be increased the testing. I don't know if that will constitute widespread testing, but it certainly will increase the number of persons who are tested. Right. In terms of the establishment of the flu clinic, do you think that has helped um, considerably with the detection of COVID-19 uh, cases on Montserrat? I think the flu clinic is a double-edged sword. It certainly has helped because when it first opened, we had 25 plus persons every day mm -hmm. attending. And it was through that mechanism that we identified, I think that 10 out of the 11 positive cases nine or ten out of the eleven positive cases so it certainly did work now persons some persons out there though are a little bit hesitant to attend a flu clinic so you have that other demographic who don't want to be associated with a quote-unquote flu clinic so they would stay at home and prefer not to attend the flu clinic for for various reasons but even though it's a double-edged sword it there is more positive and negative regarding the flu clinic and persons who have actually visited the flu clinic have reported that the experience was a good one in that it wasn't crowded it wasn't they didn't feel stigmatized in any way when they got there that the treatment that they received was quite professional and so that has encouraged them to encourage others okay. what is the ministry's policy or view on the use of rapid test kits? 
Okay, so in terms of the rapid test kits, um, those are antibody tests. So basically the body develops antibodies to work against the virus, and that will give you some level of immunity. However, um, to date, there are no public health authorities in the world that are recommending these tests at the moment, simply because the ones that have been developed so far are not specific or sensitive enough. So we've been having a lot of false positives and false negative tests um, coming from these rapid kits. Now, it's not to say that they're not useful. Um, you can determine some amount of immunity in your population by using them. It's just that you have to be cautious with interpreting your results. So we did receive um, a donation from the Commonwealth of Dominica, and we are very grateful for the, do for the donation. Sorry. Um, but we are working on the policy for their use, how we're going to use them. Um, naturally, we're going to use them with the, the persons who have been confirmed um, positive first, but there is a process to, to start that. Mm -hmm. And so we are working on developing that protocol. Okay. Now, uh, just explain for me the difference between the rapid test and the other the PCR the, the testing. PCR, right. Okay. So the PCR testing basically tests for the antigen. So you're okay. actually looking for the virus itself. Mm -hmm. Whereas the rapid antibody test, you're looking for antibodies. So antibodies aren't usually formed until days after you, you've contracted the virus. So you're talking, you probably won't get a positive test until about day 14 or so. Most persons would be recovering at that point. So the antibody test is basically to tell you if you've had the virus. Can't tell you if you've had it right now, and it can't really give you an indication as to when you've had it either. Right. In terms of the procedure, is it the same for both? So, no. For the PCR testing that we're doing now, it's a swab that you take from the nose and in the mouth. The antibody testing, you require blood. So you take the blood, you take off what we call the serum from the blood, and then you use that to testing because the antibodies will be in the serum. Right. Okay. Now, let's go back to uh, discussing the equipment that Montserrat has received overall. We went through, there was uh, some equipment mentioned and items mentioned. Um, is that overall how much, ha what has been received to date? Yes, that's basically what we've received to date. Um, there are some other elements that we should be receiving. Um, that's going to happen uh, from next week and from weeks on. So we're still expecting additional pieces of equipment. So both personal protective equipment and actual testing equipment. Um, there are some other supplies for hospital use that we should be expecting shortly. Right. For some of these items, can you give an indication of how long do you anticipate these actually lasting, the supplies ac actually lasting us for on Montserrat? Is there an average time that you would say, um, you know, gloves, a set of gloves of 200 would last for two weeks. Is there an average that you can give for some of these items? Fiona, that is quite difficult to say because the duration will depend on the number of cases suspected and confirmed. Um, we do provide that information to cabinet based on what's happening at the time. Um, our current stocks of various PPE can range from between two weeks to two months, but as I said, it would vary on what's happening locally. Right, right. But we will be receiving more items, as uh, Dr. Greenaway would have just mentioned. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Good. Right. Now, in terms of the going forward, how do you see the Ministry of Health going forward dealing with um, COVID nineteen and uh, all the other health issues that would come up. How is the ministry foreseeing that and managing with where that is concerned? Well, it is called the Ministry of Health and Social Services. So that means that we have overall responsibility for the public health. Um, we have overall public health responsibility for Montserrat and we will continue. Yes, we've had to switch gears a little bit in terms of championing the 
management of COVID-19. However, it does not mean that we have not continued to provide other emergency services where necessary, and our district health centers have continued to, to be open. We have St. John's, that's the primary center that is open at the moment, and we continue to provide support to those persons who have non-communicable diseases and so on. Because as, as you say, it's, it's the Ministry of Health and it, you have to cater for the entire population at all times. And mm -hmm. I want to say on that as well as remember that prior to COVID, we were working in a hospital. And if ever time we know we need one is now. And so going forward, we still have to look at how we are going to realize that hospital so that if or when something of this nature happens again, we will be in a better position. Rather than have to be retrofitting and all that, we would have had things already in place. So going forward, while we try to develop more services for the overall health care of Montserrat, because that was where we were at prior to COVID, how best can we roll out better health care for our people? So going forward, that's exactly what we intend to do. Thank you for that. And now can we have uh, final comments from each of you, um, ending with the Minister of Health? So final comments around the table. All right, I just wanted to ask the members of the listening public to continue to work with us continue to do the things that we've been doing that have gotten us to the point where for more than two weeks we have not had a positive case of COVID-19. And that, I think I should just clarify that by saying, and it's not because we're not looking, we have still been testing people, anybody who shows up with any flu-like symptom that remotely resembles a COVID infection have been tested. So we have been testing persons and we will continue to do so. And so my encouragement to the public is to continue to look out for those signs and symptoms. If you do have a sign or a symptom or you're just concerned, contact the flu clinic at St. Peter's, share the information you have, and the team will work with you to ascertain whether in fact you have COVID-19 or if it is something else. So we continue doing that, and I think we will come out on the other end of this and be able to return to the new normal. <laughs> okay, I just want to say thank you to the staff of the Ministry of Health and Social Services who have been working under very trying circumstances and all frontline staff. We also appreciate those other organizations who have supported us during this time. We want to say thank you to our donors, including the Seventh-day Adventists who are offering us a donation of PPE. At this time, it's quite difficult getting PPE, as you know, because of the worldwide demand, and some governments are actually pro prohibiting shipments overseas. And so I just want to say we can continue to work hard with the community support and make Monstrat COVID-19 free. And final words from me, um, showing appreciation to the staff as well, also encouraging the public to follow the measures that the government has put in place and to practice good hygiene in terms of the coughing and sneezing into your elbow, etc., washing your hands, looking out for the signs and symptoms, and contacting the clinic as well if you develop those symptoms. And um, just to say that we have come a very far way. Uh, Montserrat has done very well. We've received um, commend commendation from authorities like Public Health England for what we've done so far. And so I think Montserratians should be proud of what we've been able to achieve so far. I would like to say, ex express my gratitude to the entire Ministry of Health and Social Services team for from the time um, this disease was discovered, we started the work of what it is that we needed to do. And we are at this place today where we have not recorded any new cases within the last two weeks. And as the minister would have indicated, we are hopeful that that will remain the same for this week. That would become the third week. We are hopeful that as per the protocols, we will aim to become COVID-free. And as a ministry, we will continue 
to uphold the public health principles that we are uh, that we are so called to do well let me add my thank you to those who are here in the studio right now ps and cmo and dr blake and oh the doctor and mrs pontine for the work they have been doing and for the entire staff the nurses the doctors the maids the cleaners the cooks caregivers and everybody else in the ministry that have been working and other ministries that have impinged upon the same work I want to thank the general public for adhering to the rules i know sometimes one or two people will get disorderly but i am proud of monstrations for being able to stay on the lockdown and do all what they had to do. And I want to commend every person for their part they have been played. I know it can be very trying, but just continue and remember that the life you save may be your very own. Let's continue to do the hygiene part of it and the social distancing, whatever we can do to ensure that we become COVID free in a very short time. God bless you all and God bless Montserrat.